Yeah, it's going to be all lamps. I just give an intro and then we're ready to go. Okay, sweet. Yeah, so the video camera is getting audio from the microphone, so this and that. Okay, great. So if you, yeah, if you kind of stay in front of this, it'll, it'll pick up your voice. Okay, Dynamo. Thank you so much for your help. Yes, really appreciate it. Is it possible for one of us to remotely mute him? No, I'm kidding. I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. My wife would love to have that. <laughs> I'm paying for this microphone, Mr. Whatever. Yeah. All right, well, you should be up to bed. Great. Okay, thanks. What's your name again? Rudy. Rudy, thanks Rudy. a lot. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Rudy. Is this on? Uh, maybe you have to do it. Oh, we like that. It should be working. Definitely the universal option. Yep. Yep, battery's full. Let me step away. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? No. Is this one on? Yeah. I'll, I'll just use this one. Oh, you will? This is live for sure. Yeah. I will build a moment, but I mean... Now, let's see if we can get that to work. We got check, check. Oh, just got to get a little higher. That'll probably do it for you. Check, check. It's close enough, I bet it's going to work. And if you want it, you can just take it off and hold yeah. it. Yeah. So. You all set? Yep. Okay. Okay, uh, we're going to get underway here. Welcome to our first post COVID installment of our annual Robach lecture. My name is John Martin, and I'm a professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences. The um, Leonard Robach Public Lecture is an annual lecture series sponsored by our department, and it's funded by the generous donation from the Leonard I. and Stephen H. Robach Memorial Fund. And every year it features an expert to give a public lecture on an issue related to the public interest, such as climate change, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, hydrothermal vents, anything that has to do with the environment with a link back to the atmospheric and oceanic sciences. So on behalf of the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, I am, it is my great pleasure and personal honor to introduce tonight's Robach speaker, Professor Lance Bosat from the University at Albany. Um, Lance is a distinguished professor at the University of Albany where he has been working tirelessly for 53 years. He's taught over 100 semesters at the university level, all in a row, um, and only recently retired. And anyone who knows Lance realizes that, you know, despite his unquestioned genius, he really has no idea what retirement means. And that's easily solved by going to either his wife, Helen, or a, or a, a, a dictionary. But he's not done either one. And so he continues to work tirelessly, even in his so-called retirement. Lance got, Lance got his PhD at MIT in 1969, having studied a number of synoptic dynamic features, most notably upper-level fronts. But... Lance refused to be pigeonholed. Um, he's a very rare bird in our field. He's really, truly a world expert in extratropical weather systems and tropical weather systems. And that includes observations, dynamics, and theory in both cases. Simply remarkable. He's an incredibly dedicated instructor, was the inaugural recipient of the AMS uh, Edward Lorenz Teaching Award and for his unflagging role in educating a generation of researchers, professors, forecasters, and NOAA employees. He's the recipient of a National Weather Association's Lifetime Achievement Award and the, award, and the Jewel Chani Research Medal from the AMS, which is one of its highest prizes. And Lance has served the research and operational community in numerous uncountable ways. Um, the International Cyclone Workshop, which we've talked a lot about during your visit, uh, is one in which he helped found 
in the early 1980s, and that's grown significantly. A number of people in this, in this room have benefited from attending, and it's a life-changing experience. He's also been instrumental in organizing international symposia, and summer schools at NCAR, and Scott Lindstrom and I were involved in one in 1988, which changed the whole trajectory of my life, so uh, that was quite something. Most recently, Lance has led a revolution in our subdiscipline of synoptic dynamic meteorology by forcing us to consider case study analyses of individual storms in a whole new light. Uh, that is by examining the meteorological ancestry of individual storms, because that requires the analyst to be familiar both with the dynamics of weather systems and the evolving climate scale background within which they develop. And I think such intellectual agility positions that scientist to make important contributions at the weather climate interface. I don't have time to tell you how much of an influence Lance Bosat's been on my life. I gave you a sprinkle of it. I could go on. And someday I hope to be able to do that, but it's not tonight. Tonight, Lance will talk about novel aspects of what is surely one of the most underrated scientific advances of the second half of the 20th century, numerical weather prediction. Specifically, the, probabilistic, uh, the nature of probabilistic forecasting. So I want to turn it over to Professor Lance Bosat. Thank him for coming and joining us tonight. Thank you all for coming. And strap yourselves in. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Lance. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, John. It's been great working with you for so many years um, and listening to your Boston accent, which I cherish. And all these kind words I'm trying to decide. Helen would say, "Is this, this can't be Lance. It's not the person I married, but anyway. Um, so what I want to talk to you today about is probabilistic forecasting. It's here to stay. There's a lot of resistance to thinking probabilistically um, in there. And I think my qualification for talking about this is that, I don't know whether maybe 60 people in the room, well, I've made more bad forecasts in my life than all of you combined. So that gives me a unique perspective on talking about weather forecasting um, in there. So first, a couple of words about Alan Robach. Um, a remarkable individual, if you, if you look at the things that he's, that he's done um, in there and, uh, and over the lifetime in terms of looking, thinking globally and helping out people. Um, just a remarkable, remarkable career in, the, in the, all the things that he's done. And um, for example, he's talked about nuclear winter, uh, climate intervention, uh, talking about geoengineering, and that's a very controversial subject, but whether that will be have to be used to, to take care of climate change to help out, don't know yet. Uh, it's very controversial because if you put something in the atmosphere to try and reflect sunlight, for example, what if you have an oops moment um, that something else happens that you didn't anticipate? The law of unintended consequences is always there, whether in forecasting the weather or deciding what to do on certain things. But I should conclude with talking about Alan. In the Bolton, the American Meteorological Society in 2005, tonight as I stand inside the rain, uh, Alan Robach was a big Bob Dylan fan, and he had an actual opportunity to jive, jive with, with Bob Dylan, which I thought is really remarkable. I won't read you the little quote in there, but so this guy, is, is, um, who the lecture is named here, is quite the, quite the diverse person, um, and I'm very, really, very proud to be able to uh, speak at, in, in his motivation. All right, so the motivation here, uh, weather forecasts are getting better. Um, the move to probabilistic weather prediction is irreversible. Deal with it. Get used to it. It's not going away. It's like Lady Macbeth's spot. You cannot get rid of it. Um, ensemble weather forecasting is the way of the future. Predictability challenges the good, bad, and the ugly. And communications challenge. Patient social scientists. A lot of us, me included, need help from the social scientists about the best ways to communicate what we know and equally important, what we don't know. So a quick outline, I want to talk briefly about US research and development funding, which is, funds everything here. Uh, talk about some large scale flow patterns, the weather umbrella, if you will. How good are today's weather forecasts? And what's the basis for probabilistic ensemble weather forecast? And then are probabilistic weather forecasts reliable? Is it reliable to be defined when you issue a probability, it's got to verify that it made the time. In other words, your people got to take that to the bank, the forecast reliable. So a quick reality check on science funding going forward. 
So here's the federal budget for 1955 to 2020, um, the current dollars and billions in there. And the red, uh, for example, is national defense in there. But very at the top, uh, science um, is in the Department of Commerce is a very thin sliver. But what you note from there is the rapid growth um, that occurred and then we've kind of plateaued in the last 10 years. So that means there's more competition for funding of all, for all different kinds of, from the federal budget. And one way to look at it is the federal budget history from 74 to 2014. You see that the mandatory part of the budget now is, 20, is two thirds and the discretionary part of the budget is one third where they were 50-50 back in 1974. So the mandatory spending part of the budget is increasing and the discretionary part of the budget is decreasing relative to the total budget. Now the problem with that is science funding along with everything else lives in the discretionary part of the budget. So there are more and more legitimate claims on the, on the federal budget um, and there's only so much money to go around. All right, so that's the background in terms of the, like, the support for basic science and so on. So there are certain large scale flow patterns in the northern hemisphere that kind of in it determine what the planet looks like in terms of what weather regimes. In other words, the weather we have in the Midwest uh, today or tomorrow or next week is not independent of what's going on over the North Pacific Ocean, over Asia, or over the Atlantic Ocean. And so there's the climate, you have to really think about the whole leaking of the climate, Earth's weather climate system across the entire globe. You just can't um, focus on any particular kind of region. And we have some of these large scale patterns that kind of govern what the weather is. And the, there are two of them that are primarily to understand weather forecasting. The Arctic Oscillation is a, a pattern on the left. Cold air can be bottled up in the Arctic. And if it's locked into the Arctic, it can't come into lower latitudes like us. So when it goes below zero here in Madison, for example, Arctic air has managed to escape out of the Arctic. But there's a certain kind of pattern when it's very strong jet around the uh, circumpolar vortex and it locks up the cold air and it's relatively warm in the latitudes. And the opposite pattern on the right hand side is when the cold air can come down and come out a uh, weak vortex and you can see the, uh, whoops, and you can see the coming down into the Midwest, the blue areas in the plains, for example, uh, the cold over most of the, most of the U.S. when you're in the negative phase of the Arctic Oscillation. So paying attention to what goes on in the polar regions, whether it's a strong polar vortex or a weak polar po vortex, matters greatly for how cold the winter is going to be. The other one is Pacific North American pattern, which is an oscillation between Western North America and Eastern North America, which tends to occur when it's cold in the east, it tends to be warm in the west relative to normal, and vice versa. So that's called the Pacific North American pattern because it's a teleconnection, which means it's like a seesaw. If you're on a seesaw as a kid, if you were up, the other end of the seesaw was down. If the other end of the seesaw was up, you were down. So, so you were doing a teleconnection when you were with your friend on a seesaw. But the atmosphere can do the same thing um, on a much larger scale when it's cold in East and North America, it's warm in West and North America, and so on across the Pacific Ocean. So those are the two primary patterns that that govern how the climate of a particular winter is going to, might last because these patterns, when you lock in, can last the six to eight weeks sometimes. And that's, you know, in a typical 13 week winter, uh, that's a good uh, chunk that'll determine whether the winter is warm or cold relative to normal. So to some examples here, uh, strongly negative AO, which is cold in the east, winter 2910, um, if, you look, if you look there on the, on the left, you will see where the blue shades are, it's below normal. Where the red shades are, it's above normal. Let's see if this will, yeah, it'll work. And through here. So this is the kind of situation where it's very cold in the, in the middle latitudes, pretty much around most of the hemisphere, and relatively warm at high latitudes. And then if you're in the other, uh, other phase of the thing, see, this is the mid-level flow pattern. This is the temperature at about 850 millibars, about 1,500 meters above the surface, which is a very good predictor of what the surface temperature is going to look like. And so you can see it's cold at lower latitudes and pretty warm as you get up towards the, uh, up towards the pole and Greenland. And I should have pointed out at the bottom of the time series shows that during this whole period, whoop, that, uh, oops, let's see, there we go. During this whole period, um, in here, where negative, the Arctic Oscillation, this is a zero line, so it's negative pretty much during the whole time period. So what determines when you have these 
extended periods of, 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 of these teleconnections, negative or positive, make, or if you can know that in advance, you could say something very strongly about what the climate's going to be in the coming season. And sometimes we can do it for a few weeks, a month ahead of time. Other times, you barely can do it a week in advance. And what happens when you have that, here's a particular period, for example, um, in that, in that event, and through here, frequent cyclones coming on the big blocking ridge and through here, the north, the north Atlantic, cyclones coming northward, bringing all this warm air to reinforce the ridge. But on the other side of the ridge, northerly flow coming down over the UK, cyclones in here, producing abnormally cold situations. And there you have this, look, looking on the right situation, you can see the UK is covered. This is very, very rare, uh, the entire UK is snow covered. And anybody who knows been in England, it's hard to snow there because of the Gulf Stream influence. So the, the Arctic Oscillation Fridge, there's Dublin, Glasgow, and London in through here, all covered by snow. Um, even then, in the ice, uh, we were, you can know, already see, even then, we're starting to lose the ice cover um, that each year that gets a little bit lower and lower. And so, in, in terms of our weather, when you have this kind of, when you have this kind of pop, uh, problem, you can have this kind of pattern. In the, you can get these cyclones that form in the lee of the Rockies, where it's where it's brown. There's up, up air is moving upward, and where it's uh, blue, it's moving downward and cold. And through here, a, a storm track up here towards the Great Lakes will put a swath of snow down from Oklahoma all the way up through Wisconsin, um, and through here. And then a secondary cyclone on the East Coast will wrap around and produce a lot of snow in Boston, for example, um, in this kind of pattern. So it's a very stormy pattern. Same thing happened in the next winter. But here I'm showing you so you can see the differences. If you look at Clyde way up here in northern Canada and compare it with uh, Orlando, Florida, uh, this is the, the line is the most the normal temperature in through here. Most of the time it was below normal in blue. It's called as 4 or 5 C in Orlando. If it's 4 or 5 or C in Orlando, you're not having to wearing shorts at Disney World in that uh, situation. <laughs> Um, but in Clyde, up here, almost the entire time period, because in, during the, uh, at that time was warm. I kept looking for a, a station near, nearby called Bonnie, because I could talk about Bonnie and Clyde, but I was unsuccessful in finding one. And then the time series in Europe is just the opposite in there. If you look at Dublin at the bottom, and if you look at uh, Oslo and Norway at the top at these particular locations, dominated by below normal temperatures. So these teleconnections lead to extended periods and persistence of anomalous temperatures to be the warm or cold above normal. And so it's very important to be able to understand these things and forecast these kinds of patterns. The problem is predictability is, is limited on, on these. We'll get to that in a little bit. Same thing, so two years in a row, the UK is covered with snow. I mean, that's crazy. Um, hasn't happened since. And that's just some of the weather highlights during that, during that, during the winter of 2010, 2011. There were a lot of, a lot of things. One, I, the record I think that really made me boggled my mind is that, is that there was a, the, after the Big West snowstorm, Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma broke its all-time minimum temperature record of minus 30 Fahrenheit. I had no clue it could get that cold in Oklahoma um, in there. So that caused, as you can imagine, with pipes and other things, that caused a bit of a problem um, in there. But over a deep snow cover, snow is a very effective surface uh, for leaving loss of heat to the free atmosphere when it's, when it's clear. So snow cover really matters. And to show you that in through here, and that weather pattern in through here, you had a, the jet stream was well, well northward over the Pacific Northwest, which means it's going to be mild, and dip southward into the Gulf of Mexico, which, Texas, which means it's going to be cold in the east. And during that snowstorm period, you can see the track of, this, of all the flakes representing the, the snow in there. And you can see the big cold high coming down east of the Rockies in there by the H as it moves southward, where the cold air came down. And as they all say in Texas, there's nothing between the Arctic and Texas but barbed wire fences uh, when the cold air gets channeled by the, uh, by the terrain to move southward. And to see the impact, uh, look at the difference in snow depth. This is on the 27th of January, and then after that snowstorm, look how much further south, down into te North Texas uh, in Oklahoma, was, uh, was covered by snow. And all the records that occurred during that period. A lot of snow records, cold records, and some warm records as well. And the satellite image on the right shows what's going on. So these kinds of extreme weather patterns um, 
produce, it's not just the local weather records, but they occur over the entire country. So these major teleconnection indices, te teleconnection is a very, very important part of predictability, and it, it covers the interface between weather and climate um, in there. So understanding the transition between weather scales, like on time scales of, of say one to two weeks, and climate scales on times of several weeks to months, uh, or annual, that's a very important area of research that things get rather fuzzy sometimes and trying to understand the, the transition between the two. And I love this post um, dated 4 February after the storm. I, this, uh, from a former student of mine who will remain nameless for the moment, um, I can pick up CVS 24 hour radio Chicago. The story of all the cars standard on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago was interesting. They warned people the right night before to avoid that highway. They had constant explicit warnings of a storm surge off the lake with five foot drifts expected on that highway. They did an excellent job of predicting the storm, calling it life-threatening blizzard 48 hours ahead and warning people to stay off the highways and to take public transit, mainly trains or, or stay home if you can. The trains ran extra service prior and during rush hours which was well announced in advance, and the trains ran back and forth 24 hours on the tracks to assure that they would be, not be covered with snow. Yet nobody listened. Amazing. <laughs> People were interviewed after 16 hours in their cars. They seemed oblivious, no hats, no gloves. Oh, how could this happen to me? What an inconvenience. They call this the information age. What I call it is a subset of the population is permanently competing for the Darwin Awards. And, and there's really nothing you can, you can do about it. You might as well be talking to the ants, you know. So, how good are today's weather forecasts? Well, here's from the European Center, um, the Northern Hemisphere, the skill metric is how well if you were to compare a forecast map with an observed map on a table, if they look like they're the same, that's good. If they look like they comes from different, different atmospheres, that's bad. And so that's called the anomaly correlation coefficient, how well they correlate with each other. And so this is the uh, time series that goes back to 1980 when the European Center started of the skill at the, the first day three, day four, five, day seven, and then more recently day 10. And the higher up on the y-axis you are, the more skill. And the bottom one is the southern hemisphere curve, and the top one is the northern hemisphere curve. And the first thing you notice is the convergence of the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere right in through here. That reflects the onset of the era of global, global uh, satellite coverage, polar orbiters. And because the southern hemisphere is mostly water, conventional observations from radiosons were few and far between. So the advent of the global, it's really good evidence of what the Im impact of your taxpayer dollars and getting uh, spending on global satellite coverage to improve that. A rapid improvement, very little difference. The Northern Hemisphere is still on the top, but note day one forecasts are almost perfect. When you're at the top, you can't get much better. Day three, but you'll no also notice that things look like they're kind of plateauing um, just a bit which suggests that perhaps we're reaching the maybe a limit of predictability. So we'll think, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So first of all, forecast perishability. This is a schematic to show you from different elements of how fast skill decays with time. I've deliberately not put numbers on the time axis or the skill, but think of the skill one to zero in through here. So uh, for uh, the, the thunderstorms, the smallest scale, maximum temperature has the best skill in terms of the die off. These are called die off curves in another way. Uh, probability of precipitation is green, precipitation amount is red. So in other words, it's easier to forecast precipitation, whether rain or, or snow will occur, than it is precipitation amount. And then the thunderstorms, which are the smallest scale phenomena, are the most difficult to predict and have the most rapid die off. This is an uh, 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 limiting factor in predictability. So the smaller the scale of the weather phenomena, the lower the time, smaller the time scale of predictability um, from these die-off curves. And if you look at National Centers for Environmental, Environmental Prediction in Washington, when they uh, do this, this is one, if you, what's the skill of forecasting one inch for the last, tw the last tw uh, 12 months, one inch in 24, uh, in 24 hours? And the red are the humans, 
uh, in through here. The European center is the purple in through here. The American model, GFS, is in blue, and the NAM, the North American Regional Model, is in green. So what you notice, for example, on day one, for one inch or more of precipitation, the human forecaster in the last 12 months beats the models every single one. That's called job security um, <laughs> in there. But the best model, um, the best model over consistently has been the European Center model in the last 12 months. Now, day three out there, um, there's one month um, right in through here in, in June of this year where the, model, the humans lost to every single model, but only in the month of June. So I would go, if I was the director of the W Weather Prediction Center, okay, were my best forecasters on vacation that month, or were they on drugs, or what was going on um, um, in there? So, but 11 to 1 is still better than, you know, not as good as 12 and 0, but 11 to 1 is still a pretty good batting average, um, and I'll take it. But it shows you that there's still, first of all, you still need humans in the loop. All right, what's the basis for ensemble weather prediction? We always talk about phase spaces. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> so let's illustrate that by uh, caffeine versus mood, all right? So this circle down here means the person is in a bad mood no matter whether they have no caffeine or lots of caffeine. You probably know some people like that. The person up here is in a good mood no matter whether they have caffeine or not. So those don't fit the stereotypes. What's the stereotype? Down through here, uh, no coffee, uh, well, no coffee and through here, none, all the way up. Their, their mood is independent of whether they have any caffeine. But this one, for example, the mood gets better the more coffee they drink. So you probably know lots of people along, along that line. So we deal with phase spaces all the time for two parameters to compare different things. But the basically is a phase space is just a simple way of showing how two variables change with respect to one another. Whether you're talking about caffeine and mood or whether you're talking about rainfall amount and temperature, for example. So forecast models do the, you can put a forecast model predictability, for example, in that kind of phase space. Rainfall from zero up to wet and through here, and rain increasing amounts, versus temperature from cold to warm and through here. So for example, this model, if you had a model and through here, uh, if it was dry, no matter what the temperature was, the model would be predicting dry, whether it was cold or warm. Whereas in the red and through here, for example, the warmer it is, the more likely it is to rainfall, which is what we observe in nature. Winter precipitation is less in amount in magnitude than summer precipitation. If you're in Miami um, in the summertime, you know you can get an inch of rain in 15 minutes, uh, then it clears off and steams, and then maybe a day later you get another one, um, and so on. You, ha you know, heavy rain. Um, and, well, and convective temperature because a warmer air, air mass can hold more water vapor uh, and condense it out. Now, we have to talk about probability distributions that the fundamental founding basis for understanding uh, probability, probability forecasting in through here. Temperature is, you're gonna have what's called a probability density or probability uh, state probability distribution or probability density function, different terms for it. But basically, it shows the range, the most common temperature would be at the peak of the curve, the least common temperature would be near the right, the tails where they reach the x-axis. So when you make a forecast, for example, you want the event to verify inside the red line, not outside the, not outside the red line. So if, you, but these forecast curves change as a function of time. So what I'm trying to schematically illustrate through here is uncertainty, certainty decreases or uncertainty increases, however you want to look at it, as you go, say, from the day one to day three to day five forecast. So the temperature range, has, you have to cover probabilistically the area under the green curve from a larger range of temperatures on day five than you do the area under the red curve. And I constructed these so the areas are approximately the same uh, under the curves. So, that's an in, or, that's a, so you have to appreciate that these die-off curves, the decay of forecast skill, uncertainty broadens with time, counting from when the forecast was made. So let's talk about figures from the ECM, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, the best modeling system in the world, uh, what their prediction system is. What goes into making a weather forecast? mind-boggling amounts of information and all kinds of observations from the surface, the oceans, buoys, the land, aircraft, balloons, a whole potpourri 
of observations and other observations that uh, now are no, probably not appreciated, but increasingly we're making observations from the ground, the state of the soil moisture. How is the soil wet or dry? How deep is the, how, how deep has it rained recently or not? Surface fluxes, the interaction between the bottom boundary and the lower atmosphere. All of these were crucial to, uh, uh, to uh, again, moisture into the atmosphere, whether convection will or, will or not occur, and if the ground is snow covered, that makes a much bigger difference than when it is not snow covered, and the uh, summertime eva rapid evaporation over warm, warm ground, especially after big rains, like the other day that was here, um, in the winter when it's snow covered, you get a lot of reflection of in uh, incoming light from sunlight. Uh, and radiation cooling over at night over clear skies. So all these, all these factor into the forecast. And the net result is that this is the PDF, but it's written on its side so you could see it better. So this is just rotate, rotated 90, uh, 90 degrees from what you were looking at before. But the, what uh, ensemble prediction is that there's uncertainty at the initial conditions. We can't observe the initial conditions. There's uncertainty in the initial conditions. And those errors are going to grow with time. The only question is, how fast will the errors grow? But they eventually will grow sufficiently to ruin your forecast and your day, uh, maybe, depending upon whether you were on the forecast shift um, the night before. And so you might get something like looks like this. It's not, you get three maxima in through here. In other words, these are all the same, all come from a, a, a solution from the initial forecast, but some cluster up here where it's warm, most of them cluster in between, and another cluster here where it's going to be cold. And so what do you, what do, you do? How do you choose in this kind of thing? The only way to make that kind of decision is to think probabilistically. And to show you why a little difference can make a, can make a lot, here are weather maps for two different uh, initial, initial time for two different analyses. And this is the 48-hour forecast. First of all, on the left, do you see any difference? Looks pretty similar, doesn't it? But if you look very carefully right here, you see there's, this is an ice, uh, uh, ice surface isobar, sea level isobar. There's a little separate area maximum separate from this little trough, whereas this one doesn't have that feature. This is the only difference. 48 hours integrate forward, that little difference that's barely detectable led to this big storm on the French coast in this forecast and no storm at all in that forecast 48 hours later. This is the famous Bay of Biscay uh, hurricane they had um, a, number, a number of years ago. All started from a minute little difference in the initial conditions. So when you see how a small change in the initial conditions can lead to such a dramatic difference in the forecast at 48 hours. This tells you that uncertainties in any analysis, and there are always going to be uncertainties in the data, are errors. It's like meteorological cancer. You can treat it but with chemo all you want, but you can't get rid of, get, can't get rid of it all, all, the, all the cancer, and the cancer is going to grow and destroy the forecast. The question is, what's the rate of growth of the error? So that's the basis of ensemble prediction, and you'll, you'll see the envelopes, like the observations in through here are in green, and for the most part, the green is in the envelope. This is like the envelope, you can see how it grows, expands with time. Initially, when it first starts out, this narrow envelope of poss possible solutions is small, grows, and expands. And in this particular case, the observation at least fell within the range of the ensemble, which is what you want, which is what you want to happen. So, what, how does this look in some examples? So, uh, on January to, in January 24th of uh, uh, 16 uh, February in that 2015 in the Northeast, where there were no other way to describe it but apocalyptic snows, which meant I was a very happy cantor. And John Martin out in Madison was not very happy because the coastal storm, <laughs> he was wishing he was back in his Boston area. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so um, the European ensemble mean for, showed that the forecast 72 hours in advance, they're predicting um, in through here, I mean, almost 20 inches of snow in the ensemble mean, and there are 51 members in the ensemble mean in through here, centered on Boston with another area on New York. So um, this is a red state dream, bury Boston and New York at the same time um, in there. And then the uh, Europe, the, this is the European Center operational forecast. This is separate, the high resolution forecast and um, in through here, and it's, it's got, uh, 
maximum closer to New York City, but you know, and again, double digits amounts of snow forecast um, in that area. Now, the GFS, the American model, global forecast system, 72 hour forecast, focused on Boston. And then here's the deterministic run. And I remember looking at this and forecasting to some of our students, that is two feet, that's 30 inches of snow. Was the model was forecasting 30 inches of snow. I can't tell you how many undergraduates were out the door heading to Boston, um, <laughs> so they could be so they could be snowed in um, on this environment. Now, the Schreff Ensemble. This is the American model ensemble uh, from New York LaGuardia Airport. So, what do you do with this? This is what called an ensemble that's not very well uh, put together, but one model run had over 35 inches of snow at LaGuardia. These down here had about three inches. So uh, what are you going to do? You're going to go on the air, snow tomorrow anywhere from three to 38 inches. <laughs> How do you think that forecast will be received um, in there? So, and the mean is the black line of all of these. So these are each individual members, the, if the ensemble is well defined, each one is considered likely. They cluster at high end, but more of the cluster down and through here, um, and so on. So that's, that's an example of an ensemble that's not terribly useful. If you go further to the east at Islip in through here, and now you see, you pays your money, you takes your chances um, in through here. Minimum about eight, nine inches of snow, maximum about 38 inches of snow on Long Island there. And there's the, the at least the ensemble mean is more representative of the, di of the distribution. But each one of these solutions in theory is equally likely. Now in Boston, it was much more other than this outlier here, the outlier is 19 inches of snow. That's the outlier um, in through here. The ensemble mean was almost 30 inches in through here. So the model was very, very confident that Boston was going to get buried in through here. But the Weather Service is, at the time, they're trying to figure out how to play the game of telling the public about ensemble forecast and probabilistic forecast. So they hit upon this idea that minimum expected snow uh, most likely snow, which is the ensemble mean, and maximum likely snow. So they put numbers on maps in through here. I don't think that's particularly effective in terms of minimum expected. I, I, um, uh, I think you really need to ch let people show what the range of possibilities are, then you make your decisions on that, on that basis. So when you're talking about probabilistic forecasts, they have to be, are they reliable? Uh, Alan Murphy, who was a giant in the field of probabilistic weather, uh, well ahead of his time in pointing out the need for probabilistic weather forecasting, famously said, what is a good forecast? An essay on the nature of goodness in weather forecasting um, in there. Classic article in through here on what it takes for a forecast to be useful. All right, so um, to get at the verification reliability, there's something called the Thorpex International Grand Global Ensemble. If I've got that stupid acronym right. Multi-Grand Global Ensemble in through here. It's like making soup out of leftovers. You put everything in a pot and stir it all up. So what you do is you take all the forecasts from different organizations and you put them in a pot and stir it up and you want to find out where the forecast PDF is for all of them, everything put together, but focused on the 90th, 95th, and 99th percentile. That's on the right side of the distribution. That's where the big things will be, rain or snow. And then forecast on the 10, 5, and 1 percent percentiles used for extreme cold temperatures. So on you look on the left side of the PDF if you're in winter and looking for the low temperatures, or on the right side if you're looking in the summer for high temperatures. And if you're interested in precipitation, most people, everybody's interested in the, in the, in the right side in terms of how much rain may occur. So to verify these things, we have a reliability diagram. That is, believe it or not, your forecast probability needs to match the observed probability or you're using the wrong number. So a, a perfectly reliable forecast will fall on the, right on the 45 degree slope line. In other words, if you forecast a 60% chance of rain, 40% of the time it should not rain. The other 60% of the time it should rain and that would be the ver verification. So if it falls on this right 45 degree slope line, um, you're perfectly reliable. Reliable for probability forecasts are absolutely crucial if anyone is going to believe you or take action or inaction because you, users know what their limit is. In other words, if there's a, somebody might say that I, if there's an 80% chance, I'm going to cover my crop. Um, so if you're forecasting 80% chance of the temperature going below freezing for three, three hours, for example, 
I will protect my crop. But if your forecast that every time you say 80% only verifies 40% of the time, you're over forecasting and then for your forecast will have no more credibility. So it becomes very important then to think about uh, reliability and typically with time they decrease. So here's an experiment. Um, I found out that the National Weather Service for the Eastern Region actually kept uh, statistics on probability of precipitation reliability for October 20, 90, 1994 to 2004. There's over 2 million forecasts in there. And they are remarkably reliable. A little bit off, but that's pretty remarkable. I've shown this to my, we have, I have running gun battles with economists in, at the University of Albany as to who's, who has the least credibility with the public. Um, yeah, and so I use this one to tell them, we may be bad, but we're not as bad as you guys um, uh, in there. And you might ask, well, why, why, why did I stop at 2004? Therein lies the story of modern society. What happened? We had a computer upgrade. What happens when there's a computer upgrade? Old programs don't work. It's called, this is progress um, in there. And so I've asked multiple times and no one has ever redone this program. I said this is extremely valuable information and we'd want to like to know how, if you looked at the most recent 10 year period, for example, are we getting better? Um, so this becomes a very important metric, but you can't get access to it because the program changed. So putting things, talking about making soup, you put everything in one, these are the different different uh, threshold. This is putting everything together, three, five, nine, and 12, 15 days ahead. And you can see, if you look at the different uh, models, as you go out, they're, oh, they're under, over, under prediction and through here is common. They're, they're leaning over to the right on, and through here. They're not following the 45 degree line. But notice when you average all the different ones, UK Met, NCEP, European Center, uh, UK Met model, the various, from the various centers of the four, average them all together, and note they're pretty reliable except at the higher ranges. There tends to be an over prediction, like when you're below the line here and you're forecasting 100%, it's only occurring 80% of the time. So you're crying wolf a few times. But basically then, this is why ensemble forecasting and putting everything in one, one, one bucket gets, helps out. But notice when you get to day nine, you get the forecast become not very reliable at all. No matter, when you're like here, no matter what probability you forecast, it's only going to verify 15% of the time. So you might as well be throwing darts um, in there. And but at 15 days, there's like, <laughs> look at this. You're, you're, even the European Center, basically irrelevant forecasting. But if you put them all in one, if you make soup out of it, there's at least some skill um, in, in there. But the die-off curves are quite evident. OK. so. How about high temperatures? If instead of precipitation, if you look at temperature, again, when you put them in three days ahead and five days ahead, with temperature, we're remarkably reliable. Even at nine days, a little over forecasting in through here, and less, more, more so at, at 15. But compared to precipitation, they're not quite on the x-axis in through here. But you can see how the skill with time of prob the two take-homes are, are this. With time in the for forecast lead time, skill declines. And if you put into a big pot all the different forecasts from the different set forecast centers around the world, you get more reliable forecasts. And the best thing about probabilistic forecasts, if you want people to pay attention and use them, is that they are reliable. So that if you can say that 30% of the time when I forecast this to happen, 30% of the time it will verify, that's spot on. So what are the impediments to forecasting, probabilistic forecasting go rival? So you might ask, why does Dr. Strangelove's deterministic right arm keep going up? Those of you who have never heard of Dr. Strangelove can look it up later um, in there. It definitely applies to things that are going on in DC um, and elsewhere in the world. There are good reasons. First of all, deciders want cover for unpopular decisions. In other words, lots of famous mayors in Chicago and in New York have been unelected because they didn't clear the snow um, in there. Cost-loss ratio thinking is not a household term. How many of you talk in your families about cost-loss ratios? Raise your hand if that. Yeah, that's what I thought. Nobody um, in there. Emergency managers like to make yes-no decisions, but you, that's not going to get you very far. Elected officials are very risk-averse, except that's stealing our money. Um, 
educational challenge of probabilistic thinking. So the Washington Post had this great cartoon after a surprise snowstorm in the 2nd of March of 2005. Homeland Security update. A single suitcase is all a terrorist needs to carry enough snow to shut down an entire city. Uh, those of you who have dealt with snow in Washington, D.C. know the panic that occurs with the first flakes um, that comes down. Then there's a little side note down in the bottom. It says it doesn't even have to have any snow in the suitcase. All you need to do is say that it does. Uh, <laughs> because they'll believe anything in D.C. All right, so there's the next day. Blind, the Washington Post, this is, this is five days after the new weather service director was sworn in and through here, who then, on his inaugural speech, this said, we call it, would be no surprise weather service. <laughs> and when you see this happen, you say, somebody up there is paying attention to what bureaucrats are saying, and then say, you, oh yeah, well, we'll take this um, in there. So, yeah. Nobody wants to be the director of the Weather Service when the headline in the Washington Post says something like that. Even in the UK, this is a situation uh, my friend Tim Hewson from the European Center said, Main Scottish motorway remained shut for 48 hours due to 6 to 10 inches of snow. Stranded vehicles were everywhere. Scottish Transport Minister in denial eventually resigned. <laughs> Met Office deterministic forecast perceived as accurate may have imp impacted positively on future funding. So that's what, that's what weather centers were. So what about for the customer source? This is, this, is what, this is what went out. Okay. Moderate snow for a few hours, two to four inches, some road problems. 20% chance. Rain, snow mixed, temperature just above zero degrees C, no disruption, 20% probability. Light rain for a short period, a little milder, no problems, 10% probability. Rain, snow freezes instantly on roads. Major disruption, 10%. We're up to 60. Cloudy for a while, but staying dry. This is the Alfred E. Newman forecast. What me worry? 10% probably. Rain and snow then clearing. Very icy during rush hour, 10%. We're up to 80. Heavy rain, snow, 6 to 10 inches in high ground, only bringing disruption there. In other words, people live in the hills. Forget about it. 10% probability. And my favorite... Heavy snow everywhere, several hours, six to 10 inches, rush hour, widespread disruption, 10% probability. Guess which one occurred? The one in blue, um, the last one. So the customer reaction to this forecast, thanks Tim, that's really very helpful. So what is the blankety blank forecast? <laughs> so this is what you're dealing with the, with these probabilistic um, forecasts. So what's the problem? A PDF, probability density function here, is relatively simple. We should be able to carry meaningful probability, convey meaningful probabilities to the customer. But how do we do this? Reality is there's interdependence among different PDFs, like temperature and heavy snow, can vary together. And also, bimodal PDFs, clustering, are relatively common. The PDF, as it flattens, it may be to several multiple peaks in the, in the distribution. So, that leads to then thinking more probabilistically on probabilistic outreach. So uh, the transition towards probabilistic forecasting is going to require a hard-nosed assessment of the challenges of operating in the deterministic world. And so how do we go about doing this? Uh, you just have to push ahead slowly but steadily and accept that you're going to take your lumps along the way when things go wrong. Um, start with confidence levels. Your weather service has already started to do that, low, medium, and high. Make graphical probability forecasts widely available on websites to get people used to it. Show people simple plume graphs, which is a rain amount and temperature in the media. Focused initially on longer lead times, beyond 72 hours. Um, education, education, education. Communicate better and make it common cause with social, sci social scientists. This is a big deal, getting involved with social scientists because the us scientists, weather scientists, are not always the best communicators. Just ask my wife. Um, when, when she wants to know a particular forecast and it's highly uncertain, I remember I had forgot to get something at the store, um, or I have an urgent out, out uh, thing to do in the garage or whatever, or I mumble if cornered um, in there to avoid having to make a forecast. Uh, Bill Gray, a famous forecaster from CU, hurricane forecaster in CU, famously said years ago, never make a forecast you don't have to make. 
to which I would add a corollary, still never make a forecast even if somebody's holding a gun towards your head. Because the logic is you won't get a forecast if they shoot you. <laughs> and with tongue planted firmly in cheek, start a weather lottery. My neighbor says, one of my neighbors, what is this probabilistic, you know, swear words in, in forecasting? He says, why don't you just tell us what's going to happen? I said, it's because it's probabilistic. He says, well, I don't understand probability. What you just, just last week you told me you bet on your favorite horse at Saratoga going off at five to two. You knew how to bet on a horse race and you're telling me you can't bet on the weather? Come on. <laughs> so, yeah, so I don't accept the idea that we don't understand probability forecast. Um, get off your fannies and spend a little time thinking about it because all the, half the people in this room, maybe more, are betting on sports in some capacity in somewhere. How many of you bet on sports in some form or another? Honest. Especially among the younger guys. All right, there's swelling of hands that go. Probably a lot of you are sitting on your hands. But anyway, um, in there. So a weather lottery could raise millions of dollars. We might as well get money on talking. The LFM, the, the GFS model is going off at 10 to 2 this afternoon. <laughs> you can, the students would love it. Okay, so Tim Houston said at the European Center, the impact of suddenly admitting that we don't know what is going to happen uh, Tomorrow, having been telling people for years how accurate our forecasts are, should not be underestimated. Um, but see, we were telling forecast, uh, people how accurate our forecasts are, but we weren't telling them the probabilistic numbers of how we, did, we wiggled and wagged on, on what accurate meant. All right, and one other thing, when you, when you talk about correlation, Tyler Vegan has a great book called Spurious Correlations. And Correlation is not causation when doing probabilistic research. And this is the correlation between computer science doctorates awarded in the U.S. and total revenue generated by arcades. The, there should be no correlation, but there's a per perhaps perfect correlation. But too often people talk about two variables being correlated, but correlation is not causation when it's coming to prediction. Remember, if you don't remember anything, remember that. All right, forecast uncertainty. The European prediction, Center Prediction System um, in there. So chaos at 50. Uh, they, K, uh, K, May, uh, Modern Campbell rotated chaos at, at 50 after Ed Lorenz's famous uh, idea of, of growth of errors um, that came out. And I had Lorenz's class in 1967, uh, and he showed us this um, that he, what he did in 1963. Um, in there, he wrote his chaos paper in 61. In 1961, he changed one, he had a desktop computer. This is a very, very primitive computer. He changed one number in a big met matrix of numbers in a, in a table. He changed it in the fourth decimal point, right here, uh, let's see, up there, changing the decimal point. Right? So you couldn't even measure that with a ruler or even if you had a huge microscope. He changed one number. And then he restarted his computer. He went out to get coffee, changed one number, restarted his computer, went out to get coffee, and came back and see what, what happened here. No di little difference at the start, but that, look at how the solutions diverged. That's, the, that's what Ed Lorenz yielded, and then the intuitive leap that if you had a Nobel Prize in meteorology, which you don't, Ed Lorenz would have won it long ago um, for this remarkable insight from this accidental experiment that long-range weather forecasting was going to be impossible because the solution, small errors in the initial conditions would grow with time, like meteorological cancer, and eventually destroy the forecast. And I remember a student, I was a student in this class in 1967, um, uh, and he showed us this, and I looked at that, and my brain at that time, holy cow, I use a stronger word, um, <laughs> long-range weather forecasting is impossible and this field's going to have jobs. So as a graduate student, that's how I interpreted when Ed Lorenz showed us this. And Ed Lorenz, he noted theoretician, but what you don't realize, if you, unless you saw him, he was a weather forecaster in World War II. He came up on our map wall, he would look at the weather maps every day. And sometimes when Ed was particularly excited about something, he walked to my office and stand in the doorway until I noticed him, and he would say, I want to talk about the weather, and it didn't matter what Ed Lorenz was doing, what I was doing, if he wanted to talk about the weather, I was going to talk about the weather with Ed Lorenz. That was the kind of guy that um, Ed Lorenz was. And he also originally, at one point, held the record for the fastest climb up Mount Washington in New Hampshire. So he was a billy goat um, that could, could go everywhere. But what a brainy billy goat. Um, 
So this is the whole basis for, un for why we have to think about everything probabilistically and the, un and the errors that will grow uncertainty. So here's another way to think about it, why we have different forecasts. Everyone's probably played archery at some point. You try to hit the bullseye, but this is an ensemble. It's an ensemble of arrows. Okay? None of them exactly hit the bullseye, but they're all in different places. That's an ensemble of arrows. So it's like an ensemble of forecasts. If these are the forecasts, if you had a dartboard and you were forecasting, you know, instead of colors here, you had rain, snow, whatever, and you shot the arrows at a dartboard, you'd have an ensemble of, of, of forecasts. This is the way to think about what an ensemble is. Um, the tighter its group, the higher the like believability of the forecast. The more the arrows are dispersed all over the target, the more um, like you know, leave it like loaves, leaves of three, let them be when you're dealing with poison ivy um, in there. So that's one of the things you think about. And the other thing you think about is uh, what happens when when you have forecast distributions with time. Um, they can shift and they broaden and they may, you may shift the tails and you may shift the magnitude. So the PDFs have to, have, are, can, can change in lots of different ways. The bottom one is the change in the mean and the change in the variance. This is just the change in the variance and this is the change in the mean um, in through here. So all these are possible, possible outcomes and why you want to look at the, large, the probabilistic distribution. So precipitation changes in a future climate, for example, the um, evidence seems to be that we'll have more heavy precipitation like what happened here a couple of days ago, for, uh, for example, but less, ex less, uh, less lighter events and more average and heavier events and what the climate model suggests will happen um, in, that, in, that, in that distribution. So what would that look like if you go in terms of a probability dis distribution of what that would look like? So if it's temperature at the top, uh, fewer cold, cold days, more, more hot days, uh, more, more cold ensembles, more cold extremes, uh, more uh, uh, hot extremes in here and through here. And more, and this would be when it shifts over here, you have both more fewer and more uh, cold extremes and more hot extremes in through here. So you can look at these distributions in these different ways. But each, either way, what's going to happen is the right side of the distribution, whether it's rainfall or whether it's temperature, you're going to see more under the curve in through here in a warming climate and less under the curve on the left side in a warming climate when you're looking at cold. So these are, how, these are how one way to think about how the climate change is going to be manifest in probability distributions. So current versus future climate. Another way, now ignore the left right hand side of the diagram. Just look at say the average temperature will be less cold weather and more hot weather in through here and the mean will shift. So this is without changing the distribution. So basically the PDF is going to shift to the right. Uh, and you, but you're still going to have, even in a warmer climate, you're going to have a probability distribution you're going to have to deal with. Some forecast uncertainty examples. On the 4th of September, I decided to use the, I went to the European Center Ensemble and looked at the accumulated rainfall for Madison forecast, and they make a 15-day forecast, and they have 51 members in the control, 50 members plus the control in through here. So these are the time forecast of rainfall amount starting on the 4th of September at midnight, 0Z Greenwich time, all the way through to, what's the date here? Uh, the 19th, which is a few days, few days from now. So, for example, ensemble member 41 has right here, or 40, excuse me, had gray, basically no rain during the high period. Ensemble 43 in through here has up to three to a third inches with the rain between the 11th and 12th of September. Um, okay, so that was basically the big rain that you had. But how many had like that? This is the only one out of the 50 members in through here. Um, this one had rain starting uh, today. A lot of rain starting today. Didn't look like it rained very much today uh, <laughs> out there. So you see um, every single member of the ensemble, and they remember, they're equally likely solutions. So how would you use this? There are 50 of them. So how would you use it if you were asking, would a, a one inch or more of rain fall on the 14th of September, the 13th and 14th of September at Madison? One out of 50. That's a 2% probability. So that was an extraordinarily rare event that just happened. And the best model in the world initialized about a week ahead of time, six days ahead of time, and through seven days ahead of time and through here, uh, only one of the ensemble members got it. That shows you the perishability of the forecast. 
And here's, okay, so here's the surface temperature forecast, the same kind of, this is from the American model, giving them equal time, but not as many members in 30 and through here, and the different temperatures. So you see, it looks much more like a smorgasbord as you go to the right in here on day 10. Everything is pretty uniform early on in through here. So you get lots of different solutions. So if you look on, on, day, on day 10, for example, in through here, what have we got? We have 290, we have 399, the highest is 95, 92 and 92. So three of the 30 members are forecasting above 90. And on the other end, there's a 59 there and there's a 55 here. So if you had a, if you had a, a, a forecast that's going to be on the 14th. You can on the radio. Well, highs on, on the 14th are going to range from 55 to 95. What do you think the reaction of the, of the public is going to be to that kind of forecast? But that's the possible range. And so you can look here and see what's the most common number. You can just make a PDF. You see a lot, of, a lot of numbers in the 80s and a lot of numbers in the 70s. So the most likely temperature range would be in the 70s to low 80s. So these kinds of diagrams, this is a new way to show and illustrate forecasts. I would like to think that these kinds of matrices will become part of regular forecasting. But anyone with half a brain should be able to understand this kind of figure after a while, getting used to what it's saying. And I just showed you rainfall and temperature, but you could think about other variables you might use, like in the fall, what's the probability of going below zero, uh, 32 Fahrenheit for two or more hours? That might be useful for agricultural purposes, the extent and, and timing of, of a freeze, for example. Likewise, for air conditioning use in the summer, what's the, how many hours are likely above 95 Fahrenheit on July 10th, 2023, for example? And the, on the seasonal scale, this is the forecast for October, November, December this year from the European Center, the flow in mid-levels. All you need to know is red is where they're forecasting above normal heights. So pretty much everywhere in the subtropics and the lower mid-latitudes is forecast to have above normal heights, which means a warm autumn across much of the northern hemisphere is in the forecast. Uh, uh -huh. In there, and if you look at the temperature um, and, and through here, so this is the seasonal forecast. So this is uh, the uh, temperature. Oh, wait a minute. Hold, hold on a second. I can read my own handwriting in here. So this is 51% chance. This is the A50 millibar temperature, which helps control. Whoops, helps control what the uh, uh, very important for forecasting surface temperature about 1,500 meters above the ground, 5,000 feet above the ground. Again, pretty much warm everywhere in the northern hemisphere. So the European Central Climate Forecast System is going for a warm autumn almost everywhere, particularly over across North America and across much of the Pacific Ocean. The skill levels of these kinds of forecasts are very, very low. So I want to finish up with talking about tropical cyclones, something that I've been researching on and off for, for years. And if you look at the National Hurricane Center, tropical cyclone tracks, um, where they are, you can see they avoid the equator, um, but they, they occur both in the hemispheres, the Atlantic and the Pacific, and in much of the South Pacific in particular. Uh, those are the tracks uh, for a, a number of years in here from the best track climatology, which goes from 1990 to 2010 during that particular period. Um, they're what the tracks had. And so where do tropical cyclones form? Where do they, where they see them? They form in the, in the tropics, away from the equator, because um, you need a little bit of Coriolis effect to get rotation, over warm sea surface temperatures, so you need to have sufficient Coriolis force, which is why they're off the equator. Um, low vertical wind shear. Wind shear, if it's stronger winds in mid-levels of the atmosphere compared to the ground, that makes it possible for the thunderstorms to lean over and that and they can't get the pressure to lower underneath it to start a circulation. So you want low vertical wind shear, you want relatively high mid-level uh, relative humidity, so you want dry air, could be death of developing storms, and, and so on. And you want uh, meteorological instability and a lower vorticity, we won't talk about that, but the Met majors in the audience know what those are. So how do tropical cyclones form? Mainly between 5 north and uh, 5 south uh, to 30 north and 30 south in the tropics. Favorable ingredients in particular are mean surface temperatures all about roughly 27 C, um, 26.5, about 80 Fahrenheit, and allow deep convections to form. So that's a very important part of the process. And you see when you put the formation points over the red with the warmer waters to 27 C, where the, where the tropical cyclones tend to form is over the warmest ocean waters. And now, how good is the National Hurricane Center on forecast errors? So on the left is, is here their forecast. This is from 1990 through 2018 uh, in this forecast in the official track error trend. Uh, and the forecast uh, day, day one is, 20, is red, 24 hours. So you can see with time 
the forecasts are getting better in through here in terms of the, the official track error trend. A forecast error at nautical miles like in 1990 um, at, 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 100, at 24 hours was 100, 100 nautical miles and now it's down to about 35 nautical miles. That's a significant reduction and uncertainty about, for example, if you want to forecast the land point, landfall point in a populated area, if you're off by plus 100, you know, 100, 100 nautical miles, that's a big error um, in terms of who to warn. And likewise, over and through here, the intensity error. Note on intensity, we're good, better at track, or getting only slowly better at forecasting intensity. So it's like someone like mid-latitudes. We can get better on forecasting where the storm is going to go, but intensity sometimes is a problem. And it's especially a problem in hurricanes because latent heat of condensation is an important driver of the storm. Now, what about if you look at track and intensity errors um, just for the North Atlantic, uh, track errors in through here on a longer time scale. This goes back to 1970. So now we have a much longer time series. You have 50-year time series in through here. So you can see at the beginning, in the early 1970s, the forecast error in this particular year was 700 nautical miles. I mean, rather than issue a forecast, you might as well have been throwing darts at a dartboard and you would have had a better track error um, in there. But you can see how particularly the longer time ranges um, in through here, obviously that was 96, uh, 120 hours, they started making a 120 hour forecast at about 2000, a little after 2000. But notice they're coming down and getting closer together on, on, the, on the track, but the error intensity is more of a challenge. You can see there's a lot of uncertainty from year to year, but again, the challenge is over the long time period predicting hurricane intensity relative to track. We're much better at saying it's going to go to, say, Rhode Island, but we're not so good at saying what the strongest winds will be, what the range of wind speeds will be several days out compared to what we were 10 or 20 years ago. And you can look at it, another way to look at it is the decay layers in through there, and with each succeeding decade, in through here, the errors are coming down at the longer range, and the range in the ensemble members in through here, you can see the variations becoming tighter for all the different storms compared to all over the, all over the place. They literally were throwing darts in the earlier years. So hurricane forecasting is definitely getting better. What about seasonal forecasts on Atlantic forecast act, hurricane activity? European Center makes seasonal forecast of how hurricane season is going to work out. That's a pretty flat trend. How many of you remember what the seasonal forecast was this year? Above normal active season. Norwood doubled down on everybody else did it too in early August. It's still going to be above average. Well, uh, that's what you might call an agonizing reappraisal at some point is going to be needed. So that can be interpreted as much as we've made advances in producing improving forecast intensity and forecast track. Uh, there's still a lot about tropical cyclone development that we don't know squat about. Um, and that means that's a lot of research opportunity for some, some of the younger people interested in tropical cyclones in the audience. An illustrative example is Hurricane Lorenzo in here, an applied ensemble prediction in through here. So this was from 2019 and the storm was, what, was is Portugal going to be in play or the UK going to be in play? And you can see the range of solutions. The red track is the ensemble mean and the, and the observed makes landfall in Ireland and through here. But some members took it towards southern Greenland of the ensemble. Some took it towards the northeast, uh, northwest corner of France and through here. But you can see in the track and through here, so when you look at the, starting an ensemble forecast when it was in through here, you got quite a bit of spread divergence. So you have to take, the, you have to respect those differences in the different probabilities um, that occur. And actually, there's the actual path of Lorenzo um, in there. Now, most recently, some of my graduate students and I, we were all fired up about the K in the Eastern Pacific because the chance was that it might hit San Diego um, in there. So this was the uh, uh, European Center Ensemble forecast, um, initialized 12Z on September 3rd um, this year. And you can see the tracks and, and and the different members of the ensemble, some of them put it into the Gulf of California and actually had it making landfall near Yuma and through here. And it, that would have had monumental flooding in parts of southwestern Arizona and north and southeastern uh, California. Uh, other members of the ensemble sort of did a left hook here away from, the, away from the coast. But that was sufficiently close to San Diego that forecasters got very nervous 
and uh, the National Hurricane Center actually had a, a hurricane call, right? And they had the Weather Service office in, in San Diego was on the hurricane call. Can you imagine that? The Miami, you know, <laughs> San Diego, who, who knew? And so here's an example of what the forecasts were on the 3rd and 4th of September and through here from the European Center at 12Z. In the track, you can see, um, again, they clear from forming it was going to come up the coast. Some went into southwestern Arizona. Some made landfall in California. But the strongest cluster to the left hook out to sea. One day later, you can see fewer go towards Arizona, more go off the California coast, and still a substantial number goes uh, offshore. So it can change from day to day. Now this is going to be the same map, and now we put the 5th of September on here. And so this is 48, the one on the right is 48 hours after the left. And you can see the clustering, because you're closer, the clustering of the tracks is now closer, but now it's a wide left, um, you know, it's like, a, like the Buffalo Bills cook, kicker, um, and through here, wide left. Um, on a, lost the Super Bowl because of the wide left. But, uh, but wide left is what they wanted in San Diego um, and through here. So yeah, these are very, very helpful for giving us probabilistic. So ever to see, everything is going probabilistic. So this is my last slide. Forecast uncertainty is real. Forecasts are getting better. Pres uh, present is becoming probabilistic. Future is all probabilistic. Hats off to Lorenz. 1963. Thank you. Uh, we can't. We can't not have time for questions. I think the way we'll use it, Lance. Let me take your mic. Oh, sure. And you can answer from here. Okay. And you got to take that out. Of your oh right. I know to walk off with it. Where did it go? Uh, is it in your side pocket? Oh yeah. <laughs> See, I was ready to walk off with it. Great. Thanks. So, raise your hand if you got a question. I'll bring the mic around, and you got to talk in it like this. Um, it's got no range. And then Lance, you can answer from this. Okay. Let's start back here with Melissa Breeden. Hi, Melissa. Um, thanks so much, Lance, for that talk. Uh, so the 2011 case you were talking about with the um, storm over Texas, do you see any similarities with that storm and the 2021 cold air outbreak that also messed with Texas? Yeah, there are similarities and differences. The biggest similarity, uh, the biggest similarity is a big cold high comes down east of the Rockies. And there's nothing but barbed wire fences between the Arctic and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, in those situations. And again, with a big ridge in the west and northwesterly flow, the cold air is just, the mountains channel the heavy, dense cold air southward. Um, everybody play with a slinky uh, when, you, when you're a kid? You put the slinky, slinky, I ah, can't talk anymore. Slinky at the top of the steps and you push it, it goes bump, bump, bump down the steps. Well, you can, the way to think of it is the Coriolis deflection is like a slinky, only it operates horizontally instead of vertically. So when cold air comes down on these side of the mountains, it gets deflected to the, to the right, which means it's deflected towards the mountains, but it can't get over the mountains. So it's, for, it's forced, to, as it keeps trying to deflect to the right, the mountains keep forcing it to go all the way to the south. Keep your hands up, I'll find you. Uh, I'll go to Ian and then Kayla. Cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we talked uh, yesterday a little bit about climatologists um, speaking statistics and dynamicists speaking applied physics and so on and so forth. So the question is, if short-term forecasting becomes more and more probabilistic, via ensemble forecasts talking 20, even 50 different runs, how am I, the forecaster, supposed to make an educated forecaster, forecast if I'm evaluating the wrong diagnostic run? Each forecast is independent, has its own statistics for it. And the question is, models have, each individual model has certain biases and experienced forecast, and they think that they might think that this 30% chance of snow in Boston at, uh, uh, based upon the ensemble at this time, but they might say 
uh, we suspect that future runs might show a lower probability of, precip of precipitation based upon some other indicators that are not in this particular forecast run. So you still need a thinking person looking at the ensemble. In other words, this is not a free ride to solely automate the whole process and, and illustrate and put out probabilistic forecasts without having somebody in the loop. There's got to be a human in charge, and the human better understand how to forecast the weather and understand the dynamics behind it. Uh, go on. <laughs> Going back to your ensemble and initial condition page, um, how do you know what is the right amount of ensemble at the initial condition between over dispersion and under dispersion of those initial members at the initial uh, condition? We, after the fact, you can look at the verification. Did the verification lie inside the the, the PDF of the ensemble. If, the, if the, a significant number of the forecasts are lying outside it, that's an under dispersive. If on the other hand, all the, all the forecast members after the fact are clustered near the ensemble mean and not towards the tails, you have an over dispersive forecast. So basically what you do is you look at a large number of forecasts of different kinds of events to establish whether it's under dispersive. Most forecast models today are under dispersive particularly at the longer ranges, even the European Center. But the point is the European Center is better than any of the other models at that. And the best model at all is lumping everything into, into, into a big soup, numerical forecast soup. Thank you. Isaac. So yeah, going off the, uh, the soup metaphor, um, do you think that with the, the increase in, in computing power, do you think that simply adding more ensemble members and adding more constituents into the soup will continue to see a skill increase? Or do you think we've pushed that boundary? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think as computers get better and faster and keep going, you're going to see um, more, mem more ensemble members and more multiple model ensembles in there. There's arguments in the field about what's the optimum number of models. In other words, is there, is, say, a 100 member ensemble, is there asymptotic convergence after which you going to 150 ensembles doesn't buy you much, but maybe you should put your resources into another parameter that could be useful in forecasting. But start with the first things first, like rainfall and temperature, and then expand into some other things like probability of frost. Uh, which it becomes very important in the autumn, or frost in the, in the spring, for example, in, in the growing season. Or in certain, certain parts of Wisconsin. I don't know enough about agriculture, but certain crops are very sensitive to rain at certain times of the year. So you might have a farmer's ensemble based upon it changes as a function of the time of the year and what crops are maturing and what crops are sensitive to rainfall right now. In other words, if it rains right now, it ruins the crops, which if you don't, or this other set of crops, if you don't get enough rain right now, what's the probability of rainfall under a certain threshold? Then there's a real problem. I have to replant. So this is where, this is where the, the forecast, the weather, the synop, the weather guys need to work with the uh, social scientists to figure, this, to figure this out, to think about the different ways you can start applying these probabilistic um, Forecast. I think it's a very exciting period. I mean, this is really the dawn of this, but th this is not going away. It's like Dr. Strange loves alarm, you know, left right arm. It's not going away. Um, so this kind of follows up on that. My, my first exposure to deterministic forecasting was before I wanted to do meteorology following election forecasts. Uh -huh. And in my mind, it's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. The public will never... 30% means it won't happen, and 80% means it has to happen. So do you think the future of a forecaster's training is going to have to be an overhaul to that communicative emphasis as opposed to getting real deep in the weeds on the weather side of it? Okay, um, that's a very, very interesting question. I always look at 538 um, as well, um, but like on the election returns, for example. The problem is the models are not giving you a biased answer. They're, in other words, it's what the physics says. Whereas people, we know that people tell pollsters sort of what they want to hear sometimes, or if, they're, if they support controversial positions, whether on the left or the right, they're reluctant to tell people. So you are, you have, I would argue that with 538, for the most part, you're dealing with a very biased sample, unless you're extraordinarily careful. Whereas with the European Center model, the model doesn't care. It's just going to integrate the equations of motion for what the initial conditions were, and out will come an answer. And those initial conditions are very sensitive to the change. No amount of yelling and screaming by people on the left or on the right can change the, how the model is going to integrate the equations. Please keep your hands up as I look for the next question. I'm going to go to Kyle Griffin. Uh-oh. <laughs> 
Kyle's a former student. We used to argue all the time. Argue? I think that was very <laughs> constructive. <laughs> all right, both of you, come on. Um, so let's just say you have a pile of money, okay? <laughs> Strike one. <laughs> Uh, how would you choose to invest it to best improve the model system between analysis, observations, and expanding the size of ensembles or co computational resources, or if there's any other bucket, yeah. but mainly between those three, OBS, analysis, and computational increases? Well, I would say that the, the analysis right now is pretty doggone good over data-rich areas. So on the analysis side, I would put my money into oceanic observations um, with, through increased satellites um, and through here. Now, on the forecast side, not to, but was the third one you had? Just computational increases, either more computational ensemble members, more resolution. Yeah, that's a rate limiting step because we could do, a, we, we need high, both higher resolution ensemble members. They're pretty coarse resolution now because it's very expensive to run these forecasts uh, twice or four times a day. So I would put a lot of, a lot of resources into computational uh, to get the, basically get the grid mesh size down and put in more physics, more physical processes that may be hot, may be in resource intensive and can't be done with the current generation of models. Either one give you more bang for your buck in your opinion? I think on the 10 year time scale, putting, investing the money in computer resources gives you the most bang for the buck. But at the same time, one of the things they do so well out here, going back to Sumi's days at the University of Wisconsin, is satellite, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you guys may take it for granted in through here, but what was done at this, at this university in through here, just mind-boggling in terms of the polar orbiting satellites and the developments that went on, starting with Vern Sumi and his group of people out of through here. It's just remarkable the work that, that was done and the value of, of that work, and it needs to continue. So physicists in particular are really needed, and people who understand both the weather and the physics of the atmosphere um, can really help out and have engineering backgrounds and like to tinker with things or blow things up, you know, when no one's looking. Bella. Work my way in here. Hi. Um, looking at the figures you had for snow accumulation, especially for snowstorms in the northeast in New England, it's a pretty broad range for what they're giving for snow accumulation. Um, this is kind of a personal question for you, but is there one storm that you've had in your career that you thought was really good at le or really well forecasted and really well advertised to the public about exactly how much snow? Oh, geez, the March 1993 superstorm super <laughs> uh, was very well, very well predicted um, in advance. You, you can measure that on the basis of how soon the undergraduates go out the door to Boston. Um, <laughs> Um, in there, um, and why Howie Bluestein came to Albany last year with his radar, mobile radar, uh, to take in, 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 in snowstorms, um, for example. So yeah, um, every storm is different. There's always some little, there's always a, a wild card, it seems like, at every storm. And the tendency is, just like in the old military always says, uh, our biggest errors, we tend to fight the last war. Well, it, it can also be said sometimes for weather forecasting, we tend to forecast the last storm. If the last storm did this and went up the coast and turned right and went out to sea, and the pattern looks similar, well, why wasn't this one going to go out to sea? But the person upstairs says, okay, I've got them. They all think it's going to go right, I'm going left, you know, um, kind of thing. There's always some subtle, subtle differences because that little error that I showed you made a huge difference in 48 hours and having a big storm on the French coast and nothing at all. And we just can't observe with that kind of degree of accuracy to, to assume that these errors, some of which can grow very fast. And particularly if you're dealing with tropical air mass, high, high dew points and high, a lot of moisture, that error grows much faster in a, in a moist atmosphere with uncertainties in precipitation and release of latent heat than, say, an Arctic air mass, which has little amount of water vapor. So it depends on the air mass. It depends upon whether it's over the ocean, whether it's over the land, how well it's sampled, uh, and so on. All kinds of things. Or if the radius sign, a couple radius signs in critical locations where a storm is forming fail, that could be very important. 
When Louis Ussolini was director of the Weather Service, he would order up special soundings, because um, he was a big snow freak, um, still is. Um, but he would order up special soundings from different stations on the East Coast or in the Midwest or in the Southeast, depending upon the kind of storm. And those extra soundings would, uh, could actually calculate and show they improved the forecast. So data, that gets back to the question Kyle asked, the data, uh, uh, you know, and, and always, you can always get better data and higher quality data. I think, uh, in the interest of time, one more question. Uh, and then there's still time for talking to Lance because we have refreshments out in the auditorium uh, out this way. So please take advantage of them. I haven't had a question from this side. I'm going to go over this side. Sorry to cut off the public questions. Happy to talk to people afterwards. No we've problem. worked this young man to the bone over the last couple of days. We've got to be kind of somewhat polite to him. John has a problem with young. You have a problem with retire. <laughs> yeah, but who, who turned 80 two weeks ago? <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for the presentation. I'm not a meteorologist. Um, I'm a geographer, and I learned the difference between weather and climate. But for 28 years, I worked for Wisconsin Emergency Management. Uh -huh. And we had numerous conference calls with local emergency managers for all types of severe weather. And we'd have uh, people from Sullivan and La Crosse Weather Office and Chanhassen, and we would have county emergency management directors ask us, what time is it going to get to some point? Yeah, we can give, we can probably, we and, can make probabilistic estimates of snow, and, how much snow, how many members of the ensemble have snow starting by 10 p.m.? And, yeah, they these, were never these satisfied. are the kinds of things that we can do. They were never satisfied if they couldn't get an exact time. But what we saw over the 28 years that I worked there was that the capability to predict what and where and when got better. Yeah. And they had to accept the fact that the meteorologists were trying to predict the weather but did not control the weather. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what we eventually wound up telling them. They don't control it. So if the prepare. meteorologists like me controlled the weather, you guys would not be happy with the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> if I had control of the winter, it would be bad. Yeah. Well, please join me in thanking Lance once again for a fantastic evening. Thank Please. you. It was very, I really enjoyed my time here. Uh, it was, and it's really nice. I'm still not done yet. Not going home until Saturday. <laughs> yeah, and if you, if you can make it to our Friday weather discussion tomorrow, it's going to be great. We have a bomb in the Bering Sea right now. It's going to be fun to talk about. But please take advantage of the uh, beneficence of the Robach Memorial Fund and join us for some fellowship and cookies out in the lobby. Thank you again, Lance. That was a tour de force. <laughs> oh, my God.